right. I hope everybody is doing very, very well. BQ back in the place to be with a TNA mailbag. I haven't done one of these in a couple of months, and I think I think I got some very good questions here submitted from the Impact Lounge engagement group on Facebook. So if you want to be down with the group, it is the Impact Lounge engagement group. And again, I think I've got some some pretty good questions here. If it's your first time, you're looking for some TNA content. This is the number one place to be. So consider that subscribe button. Consider hitting the thumbs up. You can give me a thumbs down if you want to. And of course, in the comments of this video, whatever questions I'm reading off, you can give your thoughts. Um, you know, maybe you've got some some ideas that I haven't quite taken into consideration. Because at the end of the day, we are all fans. I am a podcaster. I'm not in the industry. I have a couple areas that I have knowledge in. Maybe one or two I have some expertise in, but um, you know I feel good about the uh, the areas where I do have knowledge. But there's some areas that I have none because at the end of the day, it's a fan podcast. But it still is the number one place to be. So let's let's jump right into this stuff. Uh, the first one is: What are your thoughts on the results TNA has had after Scott's release? So I think. Us as a fan base, I think we all, um, I don't know if we we jumped to conclusions after Scott was uh, relieved of his duty, but I think we all agree that it was just not, not the right move. What we have to take into consideration is that there is, there are things that happen behind the scenes that we're not privy to. There's information that, you know, even the Sean Ross Saps of the world is not privy to. Um, but I think we all kind of agreed this, this is not a good look, you know, and, and I think there's some, some results, uh, regarding viewership and, and things like that, that we can track that, that kind of shows maybe it wasn't, I talked often about the dominoes, you know, once that first free agency domino fell, what direction was it going to fall? And we saw you know, we saw some onesie twosies, the Motor City Machine Guns. I think there might have been one other where it's kind of like, okay, this is the result. This is the effect of Scott Demore being gone. But then we see, you know, Macklin resign. We see Ace Austin resign. Um, there, there's, you know, we Hammerstone comes in, um, Santana comes in. So we, we're seeing moves being made. Okay. So I don't think it, it, there there's some atmosphere that the wrestlers don't want to be a part of. The, the dirt sheets try to paint it as, you know, this is p potentially a hostile work environment, <laughs> you know, after Scott left and, and uh, you know, wrestlers were going to start asking for their releases. And it doesn't seem as if that's the case. So uh, with that being said, they're kind of, it's kind of business as usual. What I had said a couple weeks ago, However, is that the company's faceless. Everyone knows, obviously, uh, you know, Tony Khan and Triple H and, and people running the big companies. And we know that there's Core Bauer out there. We know there's Billy Corgan. Um, I, miss, I know I'm missing one here. I think I'm missing one. My point is, you, we just know, we know the faces of these companies, right? TNA is faceless. You know, like the diehards know what these guys look like, Anthony Ciccone and and you know Doctor Ariel. Dude, I couldn't pick either of them out of a lineup. And it's not that I'm saying they need to be on screen characters or anything like that, but you know the we should know who the hell they are. They should have a presence on social media that we're paying attention to. You know, there should have been a a mission statement put out to the the fans you know one that wasn't bullshit because they kind of put put out some 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 bs earlier but um the company's faceless it feels faceless it just feels like it's us and the wrestlers and that's that's kind of one of the issues i have and i think these guys need to step up um as leaders you know maybe they are behind the scenes that's fine but the fans kind of need to see that leadership as well if they want to have confidence in in getting behind this thing. So I think the shows have been better. It's It's been a step up since, from 2023. 
I think there was only maybe one or two episodes this year where I'm just like, dude, I mean, I mean, sometimes I'll be like, hey, this episode was OK, but I think there was one or two this year. Where I'm like, man, this wasn't very good. But for the most part, television has probably been better. And I, I can't really put my finger on it. I, th- I think, you know, it's probably just the fresh talent, to be honest with you. Uh, they did add some some fresh talent on the screen, and that always helps. It always, always helps. They got to know when to freshen things up a little bit. Some of them are signed talent. Some are not, which is everyone, every TNA's fan, every TNA fan's favorite, right? Someone who comes in for a few months and leaves. <laughs> um, but that's just, that's their business model. You know, it's something that we have to accept, but I do think they have to to put a little more effort into people who really want to be there. You know, the Grizzly Young Vets, they came on and, you know, they gave that, man, I talked about this a few weeks ago. They gave that, oh, we, we just don't want to be tied tied down anywhere. You know, we want freedom, this and this. And now they're on AEW television. They've been removed from uh, the TNA roster page. And they haven't gotten the All Elite graphic, but people are making the assumption that they've probably signed there. And it's the... It's the, you know, the dating analogy I gave. You're you're dating the the okay chick. You're not really into her, but she's you know, she's meeting your needs. So, you know, you say, uh, you know, I like what we're doing. I like what we're going on. I'm not really looking for anything serious and then the hot chick walks up and all of a sudden you're looking for something serious. So, um the last thing I'll say to answer that question is that and this is kind of a down uh, they're closer to Impact Wrestling 23 than they are to any era of TNA. And I think that's where there is a bit of a problem. Because you see it with the WWE fans. Hey, we were promised a new era. There was this graphic that came out from <laughs> comparing 2019 to now, showing the women's champions. And uh, 2019 was Becky Lynch, Bailey, and... Um, the Kabuki Warriors. And those are still the champions today in 2024. <laughs> so, you know, even you see the WWE fans expecting a new era. And they kind of promised that for us as well with TNA. But they're closer to 2023 than they are of any era of TNA. And it's not to say that they should try to recreate the old TNA, but they shouldn't definitely should not be trying to recreate 2023 impact wrestling. You feel what you feel what I'm saying? Um, that was, you know, the 2022, 2023, probably even 2021, ever since the pandemic, like that was, that was the era that um, ultimately told the company, Hey, we need to rebrand the TNA. Like this isn't working. So, but it's it just too close to all that. It's way too close to it. Next question, do you feel the roster have, has has turned things up a notch after Scott's release? Um, and if so, is there any member of the roster you think has turned it up the most? I will say, I don't know that things have been turned up a notch. I, I will just say probably the wrestling, I think, is a little bit better. I think a lot of the guys and girls are coming out with the mindset that we have something to prove, you know, they're still, they still believe, Hey, this is a new era of TNA. So we got to go, go show up, show up, show out. But if, if is anyone like jumping off the page to me right now, I had to look at the roster and my first answer was no, but then I looked up a second time. I kind of, I kind of scrolled up and down probably the one who is off TV already, but, the one who jumped out immediately the top of the year was Kevin Knight. That was the one where people wanted to see more from him. And it seemed like, hey, we might be doing something with this guy. And we know he's not a, a official member of the roster. But it was just, it was like he had the the Nevada tapings where he's just killing it. And then all of a sudden, here we are in April going into May and where's Kevin Knight? You know, he, he's someone I think people are ready to get behind. I think Spitfire stepped it up when they put the belts on them. You know, I had just called them Jobby Threat and, and Danny Luza, you know, a couple of weeks before that. Because what were they doing on the roster? Nothing. You know, then they got the belts and they had a, 
a squash match and I was really impressed with the tandem moves that they used and you know their gear looks the same and um I would say they stepped it up significantly because I was getting ready to put them in the you know at Alicia Edwards like jobber bottom part of the roster they've stepped it up um, we haven't seen them on TV a whole lot the last couple of weeks but I would say they will they have and then Rich Swan probably as well uh, from a character standpoint. He's always been a lot of fun to watch in the ring, but from a character standpoint, I do think removing the Motor City Machine Guns from the equation is going to be, is going to give some opportunities for others to step up because the company was really relying on them the last year and a half. And even though they're like legends in the world of TNA, like they're bland as shit. They, they did a couple things to give these guys some personality, but they don't have a lot. They don't have a lot of charisma. And they were really dominating the show for a while. They were, you know, dominating their respective title scenes, uh, dominating as, as a tag team, you know, regarding those championships. They kind of ran the company for a while. Um, and they're a couple smaller dudes. And it just, I, I think there's going to be opportunity now for people to step up. So we'll see, like going forward in these next couple tapings, uh, I, I think there's just going to be a lot of opportunity out there. What available talent would you sign for the knockouts? This is always a very popular one. I think I get this just about every time I do this, which is cool because uh, it's really relevant right now because this is the the most shallow knockouts roster that we've had in a long time. Not in terms of talent, but in terms of how they've been presented on television. You just look at their roster. You're like, there's no one who can wrestle Jordan Grace here. That's why you got to bring Steph DeLander in, who has already jobbed to her in four minutes. And then at Rebellion had one of the worst knockouts championship matches uh, in the history of the company. And she's still there. You know, they're using her to drag things out with Jordan Grace until they feel, until they obviously feel that Ash by Elegance is ready. I'm still on the Ash train. Uh, I like her a lot. I'm unapologetically a fan of hers. I have been from the day that I saw her step into a wrestling ring. I'm just, I'm just a fan. Um, but there are some girls out there, and I gotta throw this, throw this out there first. There's always that question that floats around: who has the best women's division in wrestling? And you, you, honest to God, could argue any single company's roster. But, uh, you know, if you make all things relative, which things are not relative, but if you make them all things relative, make all things relative, I really think like NWA is up there because they were able to do it with just grabbing pretty much obscure women off the off the indies. The current division that they have, like if you're watching, you know, some OVW here or there, you were watching AEW Dark and and shows of that nature, then you're familiar with, with the girls, but from top to bottom, they don't have recognizable names. They went out and found women to create a division. And that's, you know, they, and, and it's a good division. Like they didn't have to rely on this person came from here. Um, you know, they're not bringing in old females with names. You know, they've done those things. Yes. But, like currently, I'm really impressed with what they do. But my point of, of of saying that is like, there's women out there on the indies to come fix your division. And with respect to NWA, they never let their women's division fall apart. And they have tag team titles too, just like TNA does. But they've never let it fall apart. When Camille left, it wasn't like, oh shit, what, what do we do now? Because if Jordan Grace leaves tomorrow, they're... You know what I'm saying? Like you don't, you don't even want to like fathom what happens to the damn division. But Camille had that kind of presence in the NWA, and, and the division didn't fall apart. Now, there's been things like uh, you know, Kylan King get hurt, and um, in a very very quickly, we lost Deanna and Mickey James and and Trinity just just very quickly. So we went from a really really excellent division to like oh, shit. You know, we're in trouble. So there are some women out there 
but but the point I'm trying to make is like NWA have fixed things quickly, and I and it just seems like TNA is they've done this before with the knockouts. It's it's probably like the third time in the last five years where it's like, oh man, things are things are looking rough, things are looking stale. What is taking them so long? Especially if you're just bringing them in for per appearance deals, you know what is taking so long to freshen up this division. With that being said, they did did bring in Steph Delander. You know, there's one person, right? But there's some women out there. I think could help the division. Um, the one right now who I believe is contracted to like Ring of Honor, uh, because I never saw an AEW graphic, but the one who, if she ever hits free agency in any way, shape, or form, that you get tomorrow, you get yesterday. Shit is Layla Gray. If she, um, if if in any way, sh- Way, any way shape or form like she's still doing the ring of honor stuff because they i guess they think that's a developmental to AEW. but if she ever moves on from that or if she's ever released from that contract you go get her she's tv ready she's better looking than 99 percent, maybe 100 percent of the women out there like she she has a lot of star potential you go get her but as far as people who are just kind of out there on the on, on the free agency wire I know she's uh, working with women of wrestling, and I think she's even contracted with them. But you know, we've seen her on TV from time to time. The most TV-ready woman on the planet to me that's not on uh, a company outside of women of wrestling is Santana Garrett. She's a little older now, so I don't think that's ever going to be a thing. But that's just you know, she's on TV right now. So, but women of wrestling is a TV show; it's not a wrestling promotion. She's the most TV ready person out there, you know, so I I would, I would have, you know, I would jump on her if the opportunity was there. I don't think so. Someone else who's very, very TV ready, even though I don't think they'd want to wrestle for TNA is um, Hollywood Haley J. You know, she wrestles with OVW right now. She's made it pretty clear. She's trying to get to one of the bigger companies. She's not the world's best wrestler, but from a character standpoint, you know, she's someone who even slight of frame has this a huge personality, but yeah, Hollywood Haley J, I would I would I would bring her on. I don't know what the hell Big Swole is doing. I I, I was really shocked they didn't bring her on, especially since she kind of publicly said she had interest. That one is just weird to me, but I don't know anything. I don't know if she's wrestling on the Indies. Or I have no clue what she's doing right now. Um, but I know she has Crohn's disease, something I'm very very familiar with uh, with my ex. But I don't know to what um, to what extent she has it. Alex Grassi is another name out there. Uh, Jasmine Allure is another name out there. These are like names we've seen on television. They come in and do jobs and leave. Zoe Sky. Um, I would bring the Hex. I just, you know, I talked to them recently. and said, are we going to see you on TV anytime soon? They said, we hope so. You know, like they're out there. They're out there for the taking. Like, uh you would it it would really help save your freaking tag team division if you got them. It's the best tag team there is out there, and the TNA fans know them. So I I just that that's a really weird one to me that they haven't come back. And again, we we know nothing backstage, and even me knowing them, I I, I have no no idea. I think you got to bring Ali back. You have to. You need a that strong recognizable name in the division, and much like I was saying with Layla Gray. When Ali's best friend Penelope Ford hits that free agency, I would get her as well. I would do whatever it takes to bring them in as a team. Ali and Penelope Ford, I would do whatever. Uh, Genocide is another one good out there. Um, Ali Rex is another one, pretty TV ready. Lufisto, I think that's past. You know, if she hasn't come on at this point, I think she's like close to retirement too. And then, um, Paola Blaze, who is Paola, Paola Mayfield, her real name was on like 90 Day Fiance. Uh, I, I would, I mean, she, they, they've done pretty good at like bringing in reality stars, you know? Um, and I think she would be a cool one to bring. She's very, very attractive and she's very, uh, she's learning quickly in the ring. So, you know, there's other names out there. Those are just the ones on, on top of mind for me. You know, we could probably do a whole episode on 
on what women are out there on the free agency in free agency um, or who is unsigned. I, I like I like unsigned a little bit better um, than calling them free agents. They're just unsigned talent. There's there's a lot out there with the women. And it's again, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but it's like, man, what's taking so long? You know, like <laughs> we really want to see this um, this division grow and and just get interesting sooner than later. Uh, what else we got here? Who do I think will main event slam anniversary? I think it's going to be Josh versus Moose personally. I know they're building up the broken Matt Hardy thing, but we just got to go off the way they typically book. There's not a lot of long term bo- booking within TNA, probably longer term than like AW, but I feel like I've gotten on this show hundreds of times around this time and say yo i really hope that they push this off to bound for glory and that's not what happens i said the same thing about mooth and mooth moose and nemeth after hard to kill i really hope they push it off to slam anniversary we get it at rebellion so um usually they're kind of going for the kill pretty quickly i think matt hardy and uh moose even though i want to see it stretch the slam anniversary i think we're going to get it like on an impact plus show or TNA plus or whatever the fuck people, whatever people, people call them PLEs. Um, I think, I think that's where we're going to get the match. I just don't see that because I don't think it's going to be good. So I can't imagine it's going to main event slam anniversary. And just based off these tapings, I just think that's the direction they're going. I know they, I know Josh is like the number one contender after that weird impromptu match with, Frankie Kazarian, there's no way that there's no way that's like on an episode of Impact or TNA Plus. There's no way. You can't just throw that match together. So I think that's what the Slam Anniversary main event is gonna be. Do I think the ratings and pay-per-view buys will come up as we head into Slam Anniversary? R- ratings is weird. I, I I can't really speculate on that. The pay-per-view buys will. We're gonna talk about the rebellion pay-per-view buys here in a sec, but Slam Anniversary is always their most, you know, their top two most uh, successful shows. It's the one they put the most energy and effort into. Typically, they're able to tap into ninety-day non-competes that that come up around that time from WWE. So, you know, it it, it just historically has been a show that people have a, a lot of interest in, and it delivers more often than not. Like it's usually their best show of the year. So. I, I would be shocked if we didn't see, you know, the pay-per-views go up, obviously, from Rebellion, uh, which, you know, the numbers came out, was not pretty. But, yeah, Slam Anniversary season is usually quite a bit of fun. So it's going to be interesting to see how they church that up because they already have yellow ropes now. And that's usually what they use for Slam Anniversary. So if they're not careful, it's going to look like an episode of Impact. So they're going to have to step things up uh, pretty significantly to make that uh, that show look and feel special. Then last one here. Thoughts on the low buy rate of Rebellion and what TNA should be doing to increase viewership. So in regards to Rebellion, we knew the numbers were coming down. There was no way they were going to do what um, what they did with Hard to Kill. There was absolutely no way. Hard to Kill was, you know, was built on the return of TNA, and um, they had us thinking we were going to get surprises. We really didn't. You know, we got Nick Nemeth, which people were kind of expecting him anyway. But it was definitely built on who's going to show up, you know, uh, without not as blatant as they did with Slam Anniversary, where they're actually saying who's going to show up. But you know, they they did tease it with hard to kill you know i think well actually i think they did say you won't believe who shows up or something you know like and it was just a regular show for the most part but it was built off the rebrand it was built off promising a new era there was no way rebellion was going to do it i've been saying the last several weeks that we have to keep in mind rebellion is the d show it is their fourth show in terms of priority you could even argue it's the third and bound for glory is the fourth which it shouldn't be but it feels like it is every year but for the most part rebellion 
has not been um you know they, they've had some really really big main events but like the rest of the card is often thrown together it's just it's you know you have to have a pecking order right rebellion just it they're just number four that there's there's really nothing you can do about that it is harder to keep momentum than to build momentum or to start momentum you know how do you follow up what you did with tna i mean with uh, hard to kill but that's why i've been talking about you know you you have to have a content calendar well in advance and you have to have a plan well in advance okay we're going to get to point a and then how do how do we get to point b and i'm sure they do that creatively but from a social media standpoint there has to be a plan as well and they did things i was praising them nonstop from december through january i said they're doing everything that i've been asking them to do they did the little video packages to promo matches on social media um they made announcements that they made us wait for and the announcements when they came out had weight to them you know they were there were things that got people excited and they did a lot to create online chatter and then hard to kill was over and they went right back on twitter to check out diana perrazzo versus taya valkyrie on tna plus subscribe here they went right to the strategy on social media that wasn't working that hasn't worked and they went right back to it they went right back to a social media strategy designed to pop the marks to, to you know to pop the um, the people who watch no matter what and a lot of those people can't even afford the show to begin with they're just the ones that are the, they're the vocal minority but um, only watch the weekly show you know cody and those guys so Give me one second here, swig of coffee, much like uh, my, my, my guy, Mike Gilbert. Much better, much better. But they just went right back to TNA, or I'm sorry, Impact Wrestling 2023 in every way. The Orlando show kicks off. And remember, this is what I said after, right leading up to Hard to Kill. The tapings that follow Snake Eyes, that's going to tell us what TNA is going forward, right? Did I not say that? They go to Orlando. Um, I thought the crowd was better than people were saying it was. I, I mean, I could hear them on TV, but let's be real. It wasn't Snake Eyes. It wasn't hard to kill. The venue didn't look good. And it was like, oh, shit, we're back to Impact Wrestling. So I think a lot of people kind of checked out at that point. They said, hey, nothing's changed. There's just some new graphics and things like that. Uh, obviously I've talked to I was blue in the face about the production upgrades but you know you don't have to put money into better editing you just have to put better people in place that know how to edit a show they know how to color correct they know how to use the color levels they know how to use the contrast settings and the and um, the brightness settings and um, shadows and use and, and and how to set up proper lighting like I mean it's all that has continued to look really bad so people have checked out but being you know 500 buys for rebellion that's tough that's really really tough because it was a good show with a good card but they didn't there was no strategy on social media to get people talking which is the problem it's a lot easier when it's saying hey we're rebranding the tna and we we get you know you can build all sorts of buzz and chatter there it, there is a real challenge after that to say how do we keep that going? How do we make Rebellion special? You know, the, I think the press conference was cool. I was a part of it. I thought they did a very good job with that. That was fun. I think they relied on Nick Nemeth a little too much. I know they threw the first pitch out at the um, minor league aviators game, I think the day before um, Rebellion, which the aviators are pretty popular out here. I actually had a co uh, military coworker go to the game. So I'm at, next time I see him, I'm going to... Um, <laughs> ask him if about, about moose and nick nemeth being there but um you know they did some things they did some media it all seemed a little last minute though but it just goes back to there was no social media campaign to get people talking there was no chatter there was no buzz there was nothing it was cold between hard to kill and rebellion and these are 
the results of that. When you go right back to, you know, check out what this guy in AEW used to do in TNA. Like, look, if you couldn't get people to sign up for TNA Plus when they were in TNA, how are you going to get them to sign up when they've left? You know? So, yeah, this social media strategy was a big, um, big part of the problem here. They just went back to played out methods. They didn't introduce anything new on YouTube. Like, if you're going to kick off and say, hey, this is a new era, it's TNA, why is YouTube exactly the same? Where where's the 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 you know the digital uh, digital digital exclusives? AEW's YouTube channel sucks, also, but they have like digital exclusives that people want to tune in for, like RJ City's show, and now Renee Paquette has one. Um, the problem is they do do some things, but they put it in the members only section. Like Joe Hendry has the food fight, which is I, I like that. You know, it took me a while to tune into it, but I actually like the Joe Hendry videos. I know they want to have exclusive content for the members section. So it's it's a it's a challenge to say how do we also come up with the, with exclusive content for the overall mainstream freaking open to everyone YouTube channel. Like it's it's a challenge, but it's a challenge you got to meet. You got to figure it out. You know? Um so just same strategies on YouTube and social media and um and the show, you know, the Orlando show setting the standard for what to expect going forward. That's that's why you're you're talking about 500. You know, I, I say all the time, you you can't you have to look more like Dynamite, more like NXT than you do MLW. If you want more, and then we're, let's let's talk about you know because I'm talking about the TV show here because the next one was saying how do I get viewership up. Look, I know nothing about television. I know nothing about formatting a television show, um, how to boost ratings and viewership. I don't have a clue. But all I know is what I think as a fan, what I think as a viewer. And like I just said, you can't look like MLW if you, unless you want to have results like MLW. You know, you dress for the job that you want. So um, eventually they have to step that up because if you want more than – a hundred thousand people people watching you can't look like the show that's only been getting a hundred and thousand people a hundred thousand man i fucked that whole thing up if you want to get more than a hundred thousand people watching you can't look like the show that's only been getting a hundred thousand people watching you just you have to step it up you just do the format is still the slow motion highlights to kick off the show and and one of the reasons that I have an issue with that it's because you have to listen to Tom Hannafin and then the show starts and you listen to Tom Hannafin again. You got to listen to him the whole entire time. Like you got to cut down on hearing certain people's voices like Josh Matthews, his voice tuned a lot of people out because it's all we ever heard. So, you know, you just, you gotta, you gotta switch the formats up a little bit. Um, but as far as getting television viewership up, Again, I'm no expert here, but I'm going to tell you what I would do. There was two things I would do, and they're, they actually go hand in hand. I would establish a better relationship with the wrestling media. You know, they have a decent relationship with Sean Ross Sapp. Sean Ross Sapp doesn't give a shit about TNA. I listened to him when he was with, like, Wrestling Inc. This dude was dogging TNA just like any other podcaster. When he switched over to you know, his company now, and they're very successful. His tune totally changed. I once called him out on that on social media, and he did not appreciate it. But I know what I heard. I know, I know that when he was with this group of guys over here, he was, he was trashing the company. That was, you know why I know that? Because it's right out around the time I started doing this. And one of the reasons I started doing this was to, be a more positive voice. Now, clearly I'm not that same positive voice now, but at the time that I started the channel, I was, and he was one of the reasons. So that's why I know. And then he switched over to, you know, fightful, which I don't know if it's his company or I really don't care. Cause I'm not a dirt sheet guy. Don't give two shits in the world, but now he has a better relationship with the company. I don't trust him, but there's other media outlets out there. Um, especially influence, uh, influential podcasters 
that I just don't get the feeling they have great relationships with. I mean, I was at the media event, right? Like, <laughs> who am I? You know what I'm saying? Um, so I think they have to somehow establish a better um, relationship with influential people in the wrestling world. You know, these big podcasting channels and no one's talking about them. I'm one of the biggest channels talking about them. My reach is not that great in comparison. But what I would do is um, I would I would revisit the Broken Hardy's formula. What do I mean by the Broken Hardy's formula? I don't mean do the final deletion. But if you remember the highest viewed episode ever of Impact post Spike TV was the Broken Hardy's final deletion episode. I think it got up to 400,000. With DVR, it, it probably did another 200,000. But what did they do with that with that episode? They sent, they did their, the single best social media campaign this company has ever done. And they sent out the match ahead of time to every influential podcaster and voice that was out there in wrestling and had them record their live reactions. And then they pushed that on YouTube and, and good things happen from it. I think you have to have a strategy where you hit up the Jim Cornettes, the Eric Bischoffs, the Vince Russo's. People, yeah, you know, these are people you guys don't like. I get that. All, all these guys, uh, um, all these guys on a, what's that fucker's name? Uh, uh, Conrad. All these guys on Conrad's networks. You know, Kevin Nash and these dudes. People who don't watch the show. You reach out to all them and you challenge them. You make it a public social media campaign. You ta- you challenge them to watch an episode of Impact and review it the next day. People who don't typically uh, review it but are getting 20, 30, even the, even the podcasters that are like not in the industry but are, you know, the JD from NYs, the fucking uh, Sala Monsters, like guys who don't typically like TNA or follow it, you challenge these guys. Watch one episode. Don't do like D'Lo Brown said. Watch three episodes. You hook people with one. I, I, I challenge you to watch this one singular episode and talk about it. And the online buzz the next day would be massive. There was years ago, um, you know, the Phoenix Suns, who they have no issues with attendance now, but this was maybe a decade ago. Their, their attendance was horrible. Um, you know, it was like a lot of people that showed up were kind of there for the visitors and, you know, the team stunk for a really long time. And they did a promotion one time just saying, you know, buy a ticket for this next game. Next game. We guarantee you will have fun. They didn't do really anything special. Like they didn't have, you know, the like David Copperfield didn't come do the halftime show. You know what I'm saying? But like they just said, just come to the game. We guarantee you'll have fun. Like, yeah, they kind of stepped things up a little bit within the arena, but they challenged the fan base to come out and support. And they said, and if you didn't have fun, we will refund your ticket. They packed out the arena and they did have some refunds. Some people did ask for their refund, but they packed out the arena and it was kind of the beginning of a resurgence for the franchise. Um, and, and you know, there's been teams, the Atlanta Hawks and stuff over the years that have had to come up with very creative ways to, to get people re-engaged in the company. And it's, it's stuck since then, but you know, reach out to these dudes, take a chance, guarantee that they will enjoy the episode and just see what the reactions are. Whether they say it's good or bad, I, you know, you have to, you just have to have some balls and take a chance. But then you put your best foot forward because they've had a couple episodes, you know, the one where Kenny Omega showed up and viewership was up. The rest of the episode was ass. Let's be honest. 
we were saying it back then like what why did they put this episode on there with, with with kenny omega coming on why didn't they put their best foot forward really this something very similar happened with um the broken hardy's episode as a matter of fact like i remember you know people were tuning in and they said there was nothing on the on the rest of the episode that hooked them you know so they've had some opportunities with big spikes in viewership but you know imagine a social media campaign like that and and extra people would tune in as well you know like wrestling fans though the ones who listen to the cornets in the world who don't watch tna they yo i'll tune in because i know jim Cornette's going to review it you know it just just a, a large huge campaign what do you guys think of that because they've done something like that before and it's worked they have no relationship with these guys you can tell i don't listen to a lot a lot a lot of wrestling podcasts i do come across many clips on youtube these guys have no clue what TNA is doing. You know, Dutch Mantels and these guys, like, get them involved. Um, you know, Conan watches the show. He doesn't review it. There's not a lot of money in reviewing TNA on YouTube. <laughs> I can I can tell you that firsthand. Um, but that, didn't, that never scared me away from, from doing this. I committed to it, and I've, I've built something. You know, but... But these bigger podcasters, they're not going to talk TNA unless it's negative because they say, well, we're not going to get the ad revenue. You know, we're not going to get enough um, people watching, enough people clicking. But I would take a chance. I would, I would, you have to do something huge. You have to do something big to get people to tune in and to, and to stay tuning in. And then you, you put your best wrestlers on the show, your best characters on the show. You also have to step up the production and everything. Like there's, there's a big thing you can do. It, it can have a huge effect. But that's how I would um, increase viewership. That's how it increased television viewership. Oh, so that's going to do it for me in this mailbag episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope a good portion of you stayed around to the end because I would love to know your thoughts on um, what I said about increasing television viewership. But, uh, you know, come Slammiversary, they're not going to do 500 buys on television. I can promise you that. But they pretty much got what, I don't want to say the effort they put into it, but, I mean, uh, again, they went back to just being Impact Wrestling, and they got Impact Wrestling results. That was what the problem was. Thanks for tuning in, folks. I'm your boy, BQ. I'm out. Peace.